Today we're discussing the importance and history of academic unionism. Our presenters today are Dr. Colleen Avedikian, coordinator of liberal arts and sciences and professor of sociology, and Dr. Ron Weisberger, director of the Holocaust and Genocide Center here at Bristol, as well as an adjunct professor of history. So without further ado, here they are. Oh, here we go. <laughs> works, more or less. <clears throat> I wanted to start out, I'm going to have to do this. I wanted to start out with my uh, was a quote from um, Groucho Marx, where he said in one of his movies, friends and you are my friends. I stand before you to stand behind you to tell you something you already know. And then he went off in there, but anyway. Uh, so um, as you can see, we're, we're dividing this not, not uh, exactly in half. I don't know how long this will take, but I'm, deal I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of um, unionism in general and academic unionism in particular. It's a big subject, right? So uh, this is basically a summary of, um, I mean, other people who, like us, who te teach history, Robin, uh, we always want to provide the historical context. Howard and I always have this discussion for the last 17 years, right? But anyway, uh, I, think, I think it's useful to see the uh, interaction, uh, interplay, dialectic, whatever fancy word you want to use, between uh, unionism in general and academic unionism. And then um, Colleen is going to go real into depth uh, in neoliberalism and how that plays out. So um, the history, so in summary, the history of, and I'm going to be reading mostly because I'm going to read. <laughs> I don't forget anything here. Um, the summary, uh, in summary, the history of higher education um, really begins at the beginning of our country. However, uh, it's really in the 20th century that colleges and universities became important institutions. Um, prior to that, most of them, we had small colleges and small universities, but really a minute you know, percentage of the population really went to school. So we can't say they had a large impact, although you know, there were some of our well-known folks like Jefferson and others that did go or started schools. But in any case, it was only, um, in the 20th century, where uh, higher education became a significant part of the, uh, our, our economy and our, our society. Um, and that was pretty much after the Civil War towards the end of the 19th century, uh, with the um, expansion, particularly of graduate schools and uh, uh, in, uh, desire or the influenced by, uh, especially in Germany, of advanced degrees, getting advanced degrees. And um, also, again, as we know, the rapid industrialization in this country, there was a need for a skilled and a diverse workforce. So all of that kind of uh, gave rise to the rise of higher ed. <clears throat> there was, um, in the, actually during the Civil War, but expansion where public universities began to expand. Uh, with land given to various states, uh, the Morrell Act, and then um, a, lot, a number of the um, robber barons, we may call them, contributed quite a bit of money to the expansion of schools that became Ivy schools or new schools like the University of Chicago. So anyway, um, uh, that's when higher ed became important. Uh, also during this period, we have the various segmentation of the disciplines um, that we all are part of, you know, whether we're talking about history, social sciences, natural sciences, whatever, that, that all began to be segmented, and um, also the rise of professional schools. So all, all of this occurred late 19th century and then really into the 20th century. Um, in the early days of the higher ed, the um, governance system of the schools tended to be controlled by the president and, and the boards of uh, various governing bodies, very little faculty control. Later, as the schools began to expand, faculty in some areas got some control over the curriculum 
and even hiring within the disciplines. However, the administration still retained most of the power. Um, this is both in the public and, and the private schools. And as higher education continued to expand in the 20th century then, and particularly after World War II, uh, the administration became much more bureaucratized. And as we get the, the uh, vice presidents and deans and chairs and all the things that we came to love, you know, have come to love. Um, this was the case with both public and private institutions. Um, the other thing that occurred during this period was this, um, we have this whole hierarchical structure of higher ed with elite schools, um, including public and private, like the, you know, the, the, the various um, flagship schools, and then, and then the um, middle level schools, some of which had been um, teacher preparation, then eventually became state colleges, and now they're so-called state universities. Um, and same thing with uh, private schools, middle level schools, Roger Williams, for example, places like that. Um, and um, in, th in that sense, the, um, the administration, though, in those, uh, still retained most of the power, even though um, things became, as things became more complicated, but, and faculty had some depending on where the schools, but mostly administration kept most of the power. Um, and then um, with all of this, the faculties came as well as what became known as professional stamp, staff. You know, again, as schools expanded, it was counselors and all that still, that group uh, had very little power for the most part. Um, they were actually what the economist uh, Gary Rhodes says, are, were, and may are managed professionals. That's, that's what he labels us, them. This be, uh, now, this began to change in the 60s and into the 70s with the continuing expansion of colleges and universities as more academic workers, use that word, came into the system, many of them with working class backgrounds. Um, so calling um, academics workers leads us then to the history of unionism in general. Because um, by the time faculty started thinking about unionism, uh, unions as such were, had already been in place for, for a while. Um, and uh, the history of unions in this country goes back, well, the history of labor struggle, I should say, goes back to the beginning of the republic. But for the most part, um, the um, pr business and uh, the legal structure, government was opposed to unionism. And we had the unions uh, like the International Workers of the World and others, and Knights of Labor came and went, were put down, major strikes, but they were generally, the only union that really survived, and it was among skilled workers, was the AFL, American Federation of Labor. Um, but, but for the most part, most workers were not unionized until the uh, 1930s with the coming of the Great Depression and then the New Deal. Then things changed. Um, it was in 1930, because we got, first of all, we got a, a more a progressive, more progressive legislators and um, support of the federal government under the uh, Roosevelt administration. We also had a, a large, uh, more militant workers, particularly we had the sit-ins in, in the various uh, automobile industries, steel and whatever. Um, so in 1935, the Wagner or National Relations Labor Act was passed, which allowed workers to vote in unions and established the National Labor Relations Board, which could then deal with unfair labor practices. A number of the states then followed, although of course as then and now, there was significant difference between the states. Um, however, until the 1960s, most of this unionization was in the private sector. Uh, AFL, then we had the CIO, and the various unions was in the CIO, but again, it was in uh, steel and automobile and uh, other areas, but not in the public sector. Then in 1962, President Kennedy issued an executive order guaranteeing collective bargaining rights to federal workers. This was significant, not very well known. Um, this set the model also for states to follow 
Again, the vary, that varied from state to state and really region to region. In Massachusetts, for example, uh, Chapter 150E gave public employees, quote, quote, the right to self-organization and the right to form, join, or assist any public employee organization for the purpose of bargaining collectively. So interesting, so that, that really stemmed, and then we have the, uh, the expansion of unions like ASME and SEIU, and, uh, and then beginning, as we'll see, uh, public teachers in the elementary and public schools beginning to think, uh, start to unionize as well. Um, but it was actually between the 1960s to the mid-1950s, the faculty unionization then began to expand in earnest as they began to see situations began to change and also they began to see that those in the lower grades, so-called, uh, were moving, had moved into unions. Much of this was in two-year, so-called two-year institutions, uh, community colleges. Um, the first one, interesting, being Milwaukee Technical Institute in 1963. That was the first one to be actually unionized uh, in the Midwest. Uh, interestingly, among four-year colleges, um, which were behind and continue behind, the U.S. Merchant Marine Academy unionized in 1966. And a college in Rhode Island, which you would never, I would have never thought would be the first one to unionize, was Bryant College, now Bryant University. The, the, only the second of the four-year schools to unionize. I'd like to know more about that history there, but it's very interesting. Um, however, it was community college unionization which took off in the late 60s and, and then into the 70s. By 1984, unions represented 160,000 uh, members in 547 schools, with 25% of community colleges being unionized compared with 12% of baccalaureate institutions. So um, we're, we, uh, are ahead of the, we're ahead of the game, continue to be ahead of the game. Um, when enabling legislation f allowed for faculty and staff to look to unionization, there were three national organizations that played the most important role in helping the unionization uh, efforts, including the American Federation of Teachers, uh, the National Education Association, and the American Association of University Professors. These were the three national organizations. The first two, as we know, organized both elementary and secondary. Uh, teachers as well. AAUP was, was only in the universities. Um, as a consequence, uh, AAUP was appealing to some faculty because, you know, it was, uh, it seemed more professional. Uh, however, um, AFT and NEA had greater resources and um, tended to be more active with community colleges, faculty, and staff. So uh, most colleges went was AFT and, or NEA, and interestingly, in our own history, at this uh, great institution, we were AFT in the early days, and then we switched to NEA, MTA, MCCC, when all 15 community colleges became one bargaining agent, which is, of course, where we are today, right? Um, everybody follow me here? Right? Taking extensive notes, right? Uh, I think they varied. It varied with uh, the various colleges in the system. Some weren't even unionized. And I'm, not, and I'm not clear, I don't know whether, about some of this history, as you point, we need to know more about that. I know that in the early days, I think uh, uh, the great Dave Feeney was president of the AFT union in the beginning. Too bad some of our uh, folks who were, I don't know if you know. Well, I was part of that. I wasn't an officer. But right, but you were part of that. Okay, so yeah, in the late 70s, okay, um, for good or, or bad. And I, I, most of the um, state universities uh, were, went with MTA, NEA, except for UMass Dartmouth, which was AFT and continues to be AFT. And interesting to see where that history is all about. Um, I know um, Colleen did some work, right, with that. All right, anyway, especially with uh, 
as I'm winding down, <laughs> especially with public institutions where there were a more favorable political atmosphere, unionization was successful as faculty and staff sought greater job security as well as higher wages and benefits. And these basic rights are perhaps most important for its members. These items are in negotiated contracts. They're crucial. However, for some, important also is control over decision-making at the institution, as well as a sense of collective identity. This is where the split between faculty, staff, and administration comes in uh, more sharply. In other words, questions, to whom does the institution belong? And who finally makes the crucial decisions about how the institution is to be run, both in the present and in the future? And then, you know, continuing issues, um, which has to do with online teaching, which has some real dangers, I think, uh, in the future, um, and also um, the large amount of adjuncts, plus many other, uh, other issues that continue to be bargained uh, on. Uh, but there's a whole ideological aspect to this, which has to do with uh, individualism versus collectivism, for example. Uh, as well as the desire for democratic decision-making. Um, in this regard, the overall atmosphere in the country comes into play as the social, political, and economic atmosphere has changed over the decades since unions first came to prominence on the higher education scene. And for that, I turn to my colleague, Colleen Avedikian. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for being here. I also am going to be reading a little bit more from my notes. There's a lot to to, uh, to relay today. So um, I think it's important as we talk about changes that we experience in the present to understand the, the economic and political context in which these, these events are happening. And so the focus of, of my um, comments will be on um, the rise of neoliberalism and specifically how it manifests in higher education in terms of a concept called academic capitalism. And then we'll look at what are some of the manifestations and then um, to leave it on a, a positive note for my friend Connie in the third row, and we're going to talk about um, uh, so what are some ways to respond, what, what should be our response to this. So um, just as Ron was saying, American public higher education expanded in the three decades uh, following World War II. A returning veterans seeking higher education led to the creation of community, technical, and urban colleges. Um, but there was significant investment by the state in, uh, fe uh, for, for both the state and federal support for public colleges and universities. So during the period of 1947 to 1973, um, the, the trend was that overall pun uh, funding for higher education increased, as did the number of people uh, earning a college degree. So for example, in 1947, only 4% of the U.S. population had earned a, a bachelor's degree, but by 1973, 25% of Americans had. Um, Christine Schwartz uh, is a historian who has uh, done a lot of work about tracking um, the, the trends in higher education. Um, Timothy Kane, who is another uh, educational historian, refers to this period as the golden age of faculty, as faculty experienced an increase in their average salaries, we saw an expansion of full-time and tenured positions, and we see that faculty earn a greater share and uh, get greater power through shared governance in their institutions. Um, we also have um, uh, other research that um, uh, regarding the economics of the area. So uh, that period of time between 1947 and 1973, uh, it was a time that we saw both corporations and wealthy Americans tolerating high rates of taxation and high rates of public investment in both higher education and also scientific research. So by 1973, only one third of all higher education faculty were considered part-time, not including graduate students. It's a very different um, situation today. So the past 40 years has witnessed a transformation of the post-World War II public university from an institution of like, social market capitalism to a neoliberal, semi-privatized corporate identity. 
Economic and political changes in the United States in the late 1970s and early 1980s led to a shift in both uh, state and federal funding for higher education, as well as public perceptions about the role of the state and the role of the state's responsibility with respect to public colleges. And these changes are um, the result of a widespread adoption of ideology often referred to as neoliberalism. So I have here David Harvey's uh, description of neoliberalism, the theory of political, economic, social, excuse me, political economic practices proposing that well-being, human well-being can best be advanced by liberating individual entrepreneurial freedom and skill within an ins in institutional framework characterized by strong private property rights, free markets, and free trade. In a 2014 interview with the Truth Out, um, uh, an online uh, publication, uh, Henry Giroux describes neo neoliberalism in the following way. I hate when people read off PowerPoints. I know that you can read it, so maybe I'll just take a moment of silence. I'll take a minute and let you read. The key part of Giroux's analysis is that neoliberalism is not just about economics, it's about a, a, a response to all of social life. It, it, it extends beyond uh, the economy. We're talking about other institutions within society. Um, he decries the negative consequences of the neoliberal turn. Uh, he talked about greater disparities in wealth, power and income, he predicted and foretold greater att uh, continuous attacks on the welfare state, uh, persistent and dangerous deregula uh, deregulation, we hear this often, right, um, about particularly health and safety and environmental areas. Uh, we see the redistribution of the wealth to the societal elites, a growing political alienation, and the selling off of state functions through privatizations. America's adoption of neoliberalism as the dominant ideology has measurable impacts. The regressive tax policies initially adopted under the Reagan administration here in the United States and continued since then have led to a loss of $800 billion in federal revenues. And this deficit has resulted in less social spending, including for public higher education, and that's K through 12 as well. In 2015, federal and state expenditures for higher education were roughly half of what they were in 1972. And according to the Massachusetts Budget and Policy Center, Massachusetts has uh, itself cut higher education spending by 31% compared to 2001. A series of phase cuts to the state personal income tax since 1998 are largely the reason for the decline in state support of public colleges. And these tax cuts are estimated to cost the Commonwealth $3 billion every year. This year, Massachusetts has the distinction of ranking 36th of all states in the nation for cutting its higher education spending. This decline in state appropriations had led to public colleges seeking to cut their expenditures, particularly payroll. And one area that, that Ron has mentioned, and one that is um, dear to my heart, is, is um, the rise. Uh, we've seen um, one consequence of the rise of contingent, part-time, uh, adjunct faculty who are paid per course, also a rise of part-time employees, both who lack retirement and health care benefits. They provide an attractive, cost-effective solution to the budget crunch experienced by the state colleges and universities. So in systems of higher education, neoliberal ideology is manifested in what has been termed academic capitalism. So Kathleen Manning has defined academic capitalism as the inclusion of corporate practices, such as outsourcing, hiring contingent faculty, corporate style executive compensation, and erosion of employee benefits into higher education. Examples of academic capitalism include high salaries of presidents and administrators. We just had two weeks ago yet another round of look at the Massachusetts, uh, uh, you know, the payroll and the outrage, you know, UMass um, leaders uh, earning over in the six and seven figures. Uh, the adoption of corporate language and mindset. Uh, at schools, and, and uh, faculty are complicit in this. Many of us talk about our syllabi as contracts, right? Uh, the outsourcing of college services, such as the bookstore, food service, online learning programs in some schools, the hiring of outside consultants, and even the higher um, housing. 
uh, UMass Dartmouth is building uh, new dorms. It's actually a private uh, public partnership with an outside um, group. Uh, also, the creation of strategies to accelerate student progress toward graduation, including statewide transfer agreements to universities or a quick entry into the job market. And of course, high visibility athletics as a, re as a recruitment tool. Oops, I, it's hard to do both. <laughs> Marketing, enrollment, and professional development is framed in corporate language. Billboards are often seen as cost-effective marketing tools. We know that it's good news when enrollment is up and bad news when enrollment is down. We also know that due to declining revenues, uh, the co colleges often partner with private business sector in the establishment and operation of non-credit continuing education and customized, tra and customized training departments as part of the employment readiness mission. They've also developed innovative public and private partnerships to share operations and resources such as building and technology equipment and the development of vocational career academies with K through 12 education providers. So under academic capitalism, the market is what determines what programs will thrive. So for example, STEM, and which will not. Humanities, social sciences. Research conducted separately by William Ayers and Christine Mollenkopf Pigsley found that the, even the mission statements of community colleges increasingly emphasize neoliberal language. Um, for example, what the role is um, of the college. Assessments of institution are also based on a corporate model. Uh, Scott Boyd, in his research, found um, something interesting. He found that in the last 10 years, adopting outcome-based and continuous improvement assessment models become necessary for community colleges to, to maintain accreditation. But these models were actually derived from the total quality management systems used in the manufacturing industry. I see some of you nodding your heads. Sorry. Here we go. There are about 18 regional and national accrediting agencies in the United States, all of which have used some form of peer review assessment that is believed to lead to continuous improvement. They all assume that colleges and universities are to be treated as if they're manufacturers of, education, of educational consumers with clearly measurable manufacturing processes and that through the continuous evaluation, improvement and production goals and methods can be modified for more controlled and accountable output. Research also shows that um, the board of trustees and the regents in higher education also have changed, that the trend has been a growing number of trustees and regents come from the private sector that do not have direct knowledge or experience beyond being a student at higher, in higher education. And they often apply corporate logic to educational decisions that focus on efficiency and revenue generation. They expect fiscal decisions that focused on cost saving measures. There is also um, important uh, that one other aspect of academic capitalism is an increased control over workers, kind of undermining a lot of the, the gains that unions had fought for in the early 20th and mid 20th centuries. Um, and that is that we have increased managerial control of the, over the work and over employees. The hallmarks of this control are managerialism, surveillance, and accountability. Shared governance is, is diminished as more top-down decisions are imposed on faculty and staff. Workers are increasingly subjected to surveillance by managers. The surveillance is facilitated by the ability to monitor work via technology. Accountability and performance of employees are based on superficial competency and measurable behaviors, such as numerical scores on student evaluations, awards, academic credentials, numbers of publications, and so on. Everything must be made quantifiable so that decisions may be made on the objective data. Sheila Slaughter and Gary Rhodes 
point out that many university faculty and administration have actually internalized neoliberal ideology and have thus become willing participants in academic capitalism. David Harvey refers to this process as taking a neoliberal turn, where individuals assume a market-like position and accept that individual success or failure are the result of whether they have entrepreneurial values and, and, and uh, behaviors and characteristics or uh, are these personal failings. They don't see it as a systematic or a systems um, problem. The characteristics of an ideal neoliberal worker, excuse me, an ideal neoliberal worker are flexibility, and that's both cognitively in their attitude and their behavior, a spirit of competitiveness, entrepreneurial spirit, using economic rationale, adaptability to precarious work conditions and job insecurity and having emotional detachment. Employees are increasingly evaluated against this model of an idealized neoliberal worker. I want to spend a little bit of time talking about neoliberalism on, and its impact on students and our relationship with our students and the relationship that students have to the institutions. Under neoliberalism, students adopt a consumerist framework because institutions define them as customers. So and students increasingly view themselves as purchasers of a product and they demand a certain level of satisfaction, most fundamentally, which is the marketability of their education. And they challenge institutional uh, and faculty practices based on their consumer identity. I read an, just a, a quick notation in one of, the, one of the articles that a student had tried to sue her institution because she wasn't able to find a job after getting a degree, right? Just that, that idea makes sense and under academic capitalism, right? I, I paid for this and, and I didn't get any, anything back, so therefore I must be reimbursed. She didn't win, but it was an interesting manifestation of this phenomenon. So <clears throat> uh, Janice Newsom's uh, quote, other than customers, students have no basis for perceiving that they have investment in the way the institution functions, either for themselves or for students collectively, nor that they have, share responsibility for the way it functions. They are encouraged to think of themselves as receivers of a service and not as co-creators of a teaching learning community. Uh, it's also interesting to note that research by Donald McCabe, Linda Trevino, Kenneth Butterfield, as well as Carol Thompson, two different research projects, found a correlation with, a, with the development of a consumerist framework of students and the rise in plagiarism and cheating. Students are ex extrinsic rewards. <clears throat> One other area I wanted to mention is the influence of neoliberalism on tenure and academic freedom. Stanley Aronowitz, Henry Giroux, and Derek Bach, all in their work, uh, see academic capitalism as not only threatening the concept of education as a public good, but it also impedes higher education as a site for the development of critical and democratic citizens. Um, Claire Goldstein and Barry Schwartz see the rise of academic capitalism as a, specifically as an attack on tenure and an attack on academic freedom. And I in quote, included a quote from Goldstein's work here about intellectual independence. In both private and public institutions, without fear of reprisal from donors, administrators, or other parties, has been, has been, I spelled wrong, has been deemed essential to promote innovative intellectual work. Most fundamentally, tenure and academic freedom protect models of inquiry with the potential to upset the status quo. So Goldstein maintains that the trend toward the expansion of adjunct and contingent faculty in higher education isn't just about a response to structural deficits or, or, or budget and economic crisis, but it's rather part of a, a rather longer trend uh, to abolish tenure and curtail academic freedom in the interest of advancing more conservative political agendas. Manning writes, recent changes, again, in faculty, hiring practices, strengthen academic capitalism, and weaken higher education values. Adjunct contingent non-tenure track faculty are increasingly being hired, eroding long-held principles of academic freedom, academic excellence, and faculty autonomy. It's Goldstein and, and Kathleen Manning's assertion that justification is an attack on academic freedom, and it, it, thus it extends the understanding of the phenomenon just beyond an academic lens. All right, so I promised my friend we would talk about what can be done. 
right? So um, the fight against academic capitalism uh, within one institution or within even a, a, a grouping of institutions is probably not going to be um, the end or the demise of neoliberalism, but there are some, some strategies that can be adopted, right? So um, what I've done is I put together um, from resources, this first one comes from the American Federation of Teachers, you know, what a faculty and staff can do within institutions. And so, first of all, just as this, informational forums to connect the theory to the practices, what's going on within their institution, how is that connected to a larger pattern. Um, uh, creating venues that people can share their stories. Uh, we do have an opportunity next uh, Friday, some of you know this, the um, Public Higher Ed Committee in Massachusetts Legislature, they're, they're taking tours of the public higher ed institutions across the state, and they're going to be here at Bristol Community College from one to four, and the program involves that yes, they're going to get a tour, but they're also going to be able to have opportunities to hear from faculty and students and staff about the ways that um, austerity measures take in, how it has impacted them. So it's important to share those stories. Um, meeting with legislators to discuss what are the emerging neoliberal practices, right? Ron mentioned that he sees the danger in uh, the expansion of online education is transforming the role of faculty and actually transforming the, the, the um, position altogether. Um, but also it's important that there's communication with faculty and staff unions, faculty and staff senates, campus administration, boards of trustees to demonstrate the harm of neoliberal ideology. I mean, sometimes naming it and, and making the connections uh, can, uh, can be important. Also, the continued efforts toward unionization. So in 2016, in the Columbia University decision, the National Labor Relations Board allowed for um, graduate students, graduate assistants, research assistants that they could unionize. It becomes important that when you are under attack or when you're vulnerable that you do need to stick together. So join, so that's important, continuing um, the union, union efforts, but also, uh, Brian Cloud talks about the, that we need to extend our analysis, right? It's not just higher ed. So the, the response to neoliberalism involves a much wider a coalition. So he writes about the need to join uh, co coalitions of activist groups challenging aspects of the neoliberal agenda. So I brought uh, in one example. Um, some of you may know about the Massachusetts Education Justice Alliance. Um, they are a collaboration of uh, union members, of uh, community advocates, parents, um, people working and challenging at different aspects of the neoliberal agenda from testing to, to um, it, um, institutional racism. The MAJA, their platform taken right from their website, um, their demands, uh, fully funding of public higher education, uh, the securing of fair and progressive taxes to fund public education, uh, less testing, uh, they would like to see power put back in the hands of teachers. This is more, this is um, more for K through 12, but certainly with allies, uh, we have, uh, we're demanding that as well. Um, living wages, you see it's beyond just the classroom, it's beyond an institution. Um, paid family medical leave for workers. Um, they support greater uh, authority, faculty at work, inc uh, increased shared governance powers. Um, also, the school to prison pipeline, looking at the way in which education is organized, particularly in uh, poor communities and, and that have large populations of students of color. And uh, by protecting communities, they're talking about uh, making safe spaces for immigrants um, coming into cities and towns. Um, partners with MAJA, we have here the, the Massachusetts uh, Teachers Association. You have the Jobs with Justice, you have the NAACP, the AFT, Phenom, which is the public higher ed, um, at the Public Higher Education Network of Massachusetts, the Boston Teachers Union, Youth on Board is a local organization that works with youth in the community around issues related to violence. Mm -hmm. So it is a broad arching agenda that they have and they're supporting each other in this effort. Um, members of the of MAJA yesterday held a press conference at the State House to announce the push for the Cherish Act. The Cherish Act uh, will, if passed, uh, bring $500 million back into public higher education. It restores the funding back to the levels it was in 2001 when we begin to see the trend and the, and the decline. But it's more than just that. 
The CHERISH Act also calls for pay equity and health benefits for adjunct faculty that make up the majority of the faculty in, in our community colleges across the state, yeah. So um, it also um, would, uh, it also, well, there's lots of aspects of the of the um, of the act, but the point is that that representatives from all of these groups were in Boston to to make this the the announcement. Um, Mass Teachers Association has reached out and asked that uh, forums be held on campuses so that we can talk about what would it mean to have five hundred million dollars brought back into public higher education. We're going to be holding one of those forums right Tuesday night from six to eight over in the Riker Bush Faculty and Staff Lounge, um, named after a great union um, president once here at Bristol Community College, right? Margaret Reikabush. Um, we are going to have uh, legislators there. We are going to have members of major. We're going to have members of the community. We have alumni coming in. We have adjunct faculty members talking about what it's like to uh, teach or, or be in a system that has had um, severe cuts over the last uh, 20 years or so. So um, everybody's welcome to participate in that. But again, the, the vision has to be beyond just what's happening in one institution. It's, it's part of a, a much larger force that we're seeing. And with that, I will stop. Ron, would you like to come up? Any comments or questions? My historian friend, what would be the opposite of, of neoliberalism? A democratic socialism. <laughs> exactly. Um, which, by the way, that is, is out there and it's part of the, the political struggle that's going on now in our country. So that's, I think that's the best. Uh, I know socialism has a scary, the president tried to do that last night, but hopefully we can not buy into that. Howard? Did you guys on the, on the challenges of, of unionizing adjunct faculty. Mm -hmm. and, and in particular, look at the tensions between you, between uh, full-time faculty and staff uh, unionization efforts and, and adjunct faculty. You know, they often seem at odds. Is that inherently so? That the interests of adjunct faculty and full-time faculty or staff somehow uh, are sort of built to collide? You did your dissertation. <laughs> so, so um, there, it's right. It's right. It's, uh, it, it's it's difficult to organize um, adjunct faculty for a number of reasons. One is um, the term adjunct or contingent facu faculty. A lot of people fall under that, right? Um, when you hear the numbers, seventy percent of the courses at Bristol are taught by adjunct faculty. Well, that's not exactly true, right? It what sometimes it's a full time faculty that's taking on an extra course, right? Um, some of our members of our adjunct faculty are not. Right, right. Uh, they can use to sort of offer these, uh, sort of spin on these numbers and very right. easily study on on before four, you know, oh. on, on what again. What what I mean, and, and even within that, we have no way of knowing. On um, the human resources doesn't track this. If somebody is teaching a math course at, at, and under adjunct, we don't ask. Are you employed full time el elsewhere? Are you getting health benefits through a spouse? Um, are you somebody who is surviving just on, on you know piecing together? Uh, courses. Uh, I mean, that's often the, the image of adjunct that we're that we're talking about. We don't actually know how many uh, folks across the country, how many um, fall into that category. Uh, uh, one of the people I had um, included, uh, Schwartz, focused on this idea that some of the tensions. Uh, where, or she suggests that some of the reasons that we don't see full-time faculty backing um, part uh, adjunct faculty has to do with that internalization of the neoliberal model that they're not um, that they're not seeing it, that if you were good you'd have a full-time job kind of a deal. Um, also, under the neoliberal model, full-time faculty don't always feel like they were the lucky ones. You know that they are also working harder and and less and feeling put upon as well. They they begin to see each other as competitors, right? Um, so you so I think it's it's part in response to the to the structure 
um, rather than, say, a, a concerted effort to, to divide and conquer groups of people. I think the fact that we have so much also spatial separation between faculty make it difficult. So many of our adjunct faculty are not teaching on the same campuses as full-time faculty. Some are teaching online. It's really very difficult to form a sense of collective identity as well. That's Right. And, 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 ability, and, and, and not seeing the ability to be fired right. uh, and if we're for any cause by administration. Right. Um, also, too, even how um, <laughs> adjunct faculty name themselves, they're often defined by what they don't have. Right, so it's often a deficit model that we're thinking about it. It's a, it's a negative, we're focusing on negative, you don't have health benefits, you don't have this, you don't have that. And so there have been, um, you know, d d real fierce uh, fights over how one should uh, name themselves, even within contracts. So uh, my research was with a faculty union um, at UMass Lowell. They are the only union of faculty in that whole commonwealth that have organized with the United Auto Workers. Uh, and I w had hoped that they would say, well, it's because you know we, we saw something wrong with the NEA or the AFT, and in reality, they did say nobody wanted to work with them except the auto workers. So that wasn't some philosophical, it was more, um, <clears throat> these are the folks. But they, they want to be called, um, they want the word professor in their title. I mean, they want to be recognized that when you call yourself that, like the, that, that describes your relationship to the student and not your relationship with management, right? Yet there seems to be, to use a very common term, a persistent, perpetually increasing supply of adjuncts. So what is happening on the edge side, supply side, that is, conti that is continuing to push people? Like, I guess, like, you know, if we have this whole corporate model, mm -hmm. why are grad students not, not corporatized? Why are they still making the passion? What a question in the neoliberal tradition. You're asking for an economic rationalization of what ed schools, we're putting too many people out, it's their damn fault. If they just chose something else, they'd have work. Will. No, no, I get, I get your point. That, that's often one of the criticism of uh, whether, uh, whether it, it, we should cut back on uh, PhDs, you know, whether, whether an institution just granting out, PhD, if we've, we've actually flooded the market. Right. Well, I feel that that's, that's like the new school opened one up and there's still like that one. There's a big outcome and, and a PhD program that had got one thing for the top of the decade is threatened the entire people. Like, no, we must keep these programs open. So there's like there's the institutional side. Right. But what is it getting out? You know, right. Like, it's not, you know, by definition, these, aren't, these are not foolish people. Right. They are people. So at some point, someone tells them this is an awesome idea. Or, or in the great history of American exceptionalism, it's not going to happen to me. And and uh, one of the one of the women uh, that I had interviewed for my dissertation, she talked about that. She says, you know, my whole life I've been exceptional. She, and she said, I just figured that if I played it the right way and did the right things, she she graduated from a prestigious with her PhD from a prestigious prestigious institution, and she was really angry because the formula didn't work for her. And she even saw in herself like, well, I know why you're it because you only got your whatever from blah or, or in that field. Even then, she had to challenge her own internalization of this was my fault for making bad choices, right? I don't know if you want to respond to that. Well, I love uh, economic rationale to make these bad answers, too. Uh, I, I think that both uh, administrators and perhaps faculty and staff as well as institutions in general act in an economic fashion. And if, if there is a program that can keep them alive, they don't necessarily it's, it's not a corporate mentality, really, because they're not acting in the bottom line of the institution. They're acting in self-interest. We want to keep this program open because of this. I want to keep this program open because it does something for me. And there are a lot of selfish decisions that are made within higher education that right. Right. Can contribute to that. 
can't jump in just one quick second. Just um, one of the things um, in the literature, uh, Stuart Hall talks about common sense, right? So neoliberalism assumes that there's a common sense so that even if you propose something that is counter to the model or an economic rationality, it, it, it just doesn't make sense. So could you imagine making a proposal that said, you know, why don't we just get rid of um, student outcomes? Why don't we not have grades? Uh, why don't we just, you know, not, you know, forget the STEM? We're not gonna connect it to, to the, you know, what the, what the market wants or where the jobs are. People say, what are you, are you crazy? Um, there is this, this common sense around neoliberalism that many of us have just adopted. So it's not even a personal thing about I'm, I'm consciously doing it. I'm in a system that alternatives don't even make sense and they're not going to fly anyway. Right? So we, we have to follow that along. Consultants. Are we at all, are we professionals at all complicit in that? We're a bunch of addicts. We are. Um, Did we, we want to? We want to do that stuff. We, well, want, we, we, want, we want to do the teaching and the research, like the fun, cool stuff that we fell in love with. And adjuncts, what we end up doing is, we, is, a, is a high chasing, that, the, that being a professor is such a, like the job itself is so, like, teaching students is so wonderful that it becomes incredibly, not doing that is such a hard thing to do. That when you have other people who say, who have the ability to take that away from you, it is hard to do it. And, free, free yourself, and if you have that, like, you know, and it's always compared to like a lawyer, right? you, know, you ask a lawyer, I'll move you out of, you know, patent law and into environmental law for a 10% raise and they will do it. What raise do you have to get to, to leave the classroom? You know, if someone says, give me your own field, like teach high school English rather than college English, you know, 10%, 20%, people won't do that for 30, 40% raises because at the end of the day, for all the neoliberal at the top, professors aren't, often aren't that. I think that's, you know, it, and when we fell in love, we fell in love with, in a classroom where you don't say, you, when the college tour like, and just so you know, 80% of the people you're going to work with are making poverty level wages. So, so by the time you decide that professor is what you want to do, and it's you're not you're out of that neoliberal space and you fall in love with a subject and the people, and you don't, you know, it's not by the time you're in, it's in some ways too too late. So I think that's where a lot of it comes with that. It's not that the professors aren't, I think the professors are in are trying to be non-neoliberal in a Emily, you've been, uh, I'm just going to jump in real quick just to make everybody a sort of quick reminder of time. We can, we can stay here, but just in case others wanted to go somewhere else, but it's almost 3 o'clock. Just, just let everybody a reminder of that, but feel free to continue on. Thank you. Well, I mean, I'm going to make an observation about the use of the term faculty. As a professional staff and somebody who loves what I do, works really hard at what I do, I often many times feel left out of the conversation when it's faculty or adjunct faculty, I feel like a second class citizen. And being a part of the union leadership, I have seen decisions that have benefited faculty, but hurt professional staff. And I think there needs to be a bigger conversation in amongst ourselves about how we support each other. You know, we may not be in the classroom every day, but I damn well educate students every single day in different subjects in everything. And so I think we need to like, you know, and, and I would be the first to say that I have, you know, seen this corporatization. I have seen my own expertise completely ignored by this institution. And I think that that's a shame. And I think that we need to kind of get back into this, you know, valuing of professionalism. But I think we need to respect it in each other you know, in the professional staff as well as the faculty, we have to kind of change the way we use our language. You know, it's like the support staff, the advisors, all of us, 
You know, it's like we, we want to support the union, but sometimes it's difficult. And I, I'm just being honest. It's like, you know, we, I think we have to start looking at benefits collectively. And I don't know if I'm, if I'm saying what you're doing. It's just I think the term. No, the term is what I was going to say, because I played with that when I left. Um, some kind of is that, like, when I switched in, from faculty to staff, I'm like, wait. I don't have to answer emails at one o'clock in the morning anymore. I have got a twenty-five thousand dollar raise. Like, my um, I was a person where like, and my, my previous faculty, all I had to do was not focus on what was good for faculty, and I could have lived a very comfortable life for very long. Is that like, it, um, and I was in tech, so I, I just moved here four weeks ago from Texas, so it's slightly different on a collective bargaining space. <laughs> Although, but is but it um it is a challenge because like I mean I guess it was like you know I don't think that it's that the word faculty is bad I think it's that no, we we've, we've minimized the value of the word staff I yeah. think like but that that those are two different um, things and you know and I kind of wonder like is part like because. Is part time staff the equivalent of continuing faculty? I'm not sure. I'm either right. of those, but, but I like, think they're, having they're those very conversations different. are important are. because I think that, like, if we don't think about yeah. the terms we use, even at our own union meetings, I think it can be somewhat negative. And I will say that, like, from where I came, I saw, I've seen, and again, I have no idea what's going on here, but I have seen at multiple other institutions the faculty, professionals, very effective, very effective fetches. And depending on what room you're and into, I think that if they understand really that, awful they things about it. That. Like, go to the staff meeting, hear terrible things about the faculty, and you're having you know, mm -hmm. terrible things about the staff. <laughs> and, and this really yeah, feeds into, Colleen, what you were saying earlier about how this okay. neoliberal um, ideology is, it, it has a big factor of competitiveness. Right, so exactly. So professional staff is competing with staff, and staff is um, that sort of in, we lo we've lost that sense of collectivism, right? Where we've, we've everybody's kind of bought into this individual model, and that leads to competition. Right. Well, and, and, and that and with the proliferation of more adjunct faculty that don't do not have. I know I've been adjunct faculty in my career. They don't have the same um, emotional attachment to the school, the students, whatever. It, 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 it's left for those people. I disagree. Well, it depends on the adjunct. Yeah. 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 Right. It depends on the adjunct. They have another right. job somewhere and they come right. here part time. That's another situation. If you've got adjunct faculty going to five different institutions, that's another scenario. Right. Right. You know, but, but I think you can't, you can't have the same passion for for the organization. Well, it depends I, I, on the individual and where they work. Well, it, it depends. It depends. But you know that there are many adjunct faculty that that they do have full time jobs elsewhere. But so that, that's a different I group. Wanna, I want to make another comment. A lot of what you're talking about here is very reminiscent of when I was working at the South Coast Health System. This is nothing. that's not going on just here. It's going on everywhere. Sure. You have, well, you have more and more part-time employees that are working. They have, there are um, high-level positions that are making lots big salaries where they're pushing the employees that are working within the institution to do, be much more productive. It, it, it doesn't it, make it right. Right. No, We've been late to come to it. The, the education right. was one of the later institutions right. to be. Is the business model academia. being reinforced <laughs> on academia? Right. right. And our administration that we have now has done a really great job of separating groups yes, so that there is more competition between groups instead of that solidarity that we need to have as an impact. Because if we don't stand together over different issues and people are trying to force the rules and even minimize our contract to nothing, which I've seen over and over again, and most people haven't been in those meetings. It's, it's ridiculous. It's just, you know, ridiculous. Can I just wait to wait? Yes, yes. I just want to share my adjunct faculty. So I'm full-time faculty now, and I'm very happy to be full-time faculty. And 
And I have been adjunct faculty, and I continue to be adjunct faculty at Salem State University, and I, so I was adjunct at two places. It wasn't because I wanted to collect money, or it's because I'm giving back to my profession. I'm in the health sciences, and there are not faculty who can teach the courses that we can teach. And but, I but love honey, being honey, faculty. That's you. But if we I were to do say, a survey of all the adjunct faculty but I'm here, thinking, I'm not sure that they would have the same emotional attachment. But I think you have to look at what they teach. So in the health sciences, I can say the people that I know in the therapy departments who are adjunct faculty are coming in with a real passion and they want to be connected to the college and universities, but they do have jobs. You know, like, they do I just want to say. Well, sure, sure. I hear that. Can I chime in while we're And I just want to share. Yeah. Um, I, I share you because I've been here at PCC for 20 years. And for 15 years, I've been a, uh, an adjunct faculty. I, I never lost passion. Right. Mm -hmm. I always had a passion. I knew that's what I want to do. So, because I was a, a faculty, uh, 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 an adjunct, Faculty doesn't mean I didn't have passion. Right. I'm not saying that. I'm saying yeah. it's, a, it's a different level of commitment because they're not here. I don't, I disagree. Yeah, because well, sometimes I think, you I think, have to I, work I in three different There's a commitment things. to the classroom. There's a commitment to the right. students. Yeah. But the overall institution. What happens when you're not in the classroom anymore? Right. You're yeah. just yeah. online. You have a passion for your students, you, for your, for what you do. Who are you going to be your uh, committed to? And, and your then computer. You, sometimes you have to work three or four part time to make one salary. Can I? Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Can I at least just say, like, can we at least get a, a round of applause? Oh, I love the discussion, right? At least kind of well, I think, you know, there's a need for this kind of discussion. Yeah. That's why we're okay. Right, that, you know, it's, it's, it's very substantive. Yeah. Yeah. In both of your presentations, so far beyond in many respects what's in the contract, how do you see a local union um, serving the constituency of the college, mm -hmm. honoring, respecting, defending the contract, but going above and beyond to many of the social elements that you're bringing up, curriculum control, shared governance, there's nothing in the contract right. about shared yeah. governance. Well, that's, that's um, that was a compromise that was made, you know, in uh, you know in trying to get unions accepted, because the uh, like in private enterprises, the, a lot of the corporations went along with unionization because it was a way of rationalizing the system while they still maintained a lot of the power. And I think the same thing in higher ed. As long as they didn't concede, you know, substantive power, well, we'll let them, you know, negotiate this, and that'll be all right. And it, it actually helps to rationalize the system. But the real issue should be who controls the institution? It's always, you know, who, who's doing the work? I'm not saying mm -hmm. they're not doing it. Who's, who's out there? Te the, the basic work of an institution is supporting and teaching and counseling and librarian. Administrators are, I don't know what they do. <laughs> you know what they, you know, you, you're in it. So uh, it's a whole, this is a, that's, this is an ideological question. That's what I brought up. Two, who controls the institution? No matter what institution you're talking about, but in this case, colleges, who makes the decisions and whose benefit, you know? That's, that's a fundamental question and that's a political struggle. One of the challenges I think that we're facing is, is um, in how, how does the union respond? I know that um, we talk about what we'd like to see uh, in the areas that, that unions should go. Part of it is that we have to get our members to see themselves that they are the union. I know we, he we hear that a lot, but what does that actually mean? We have faculty members that have never, and staff members who have never read the contract. Right, and they think sometimes of the union. I mean, you can speak to it better than me. That if something goes wrong now, that's the time we, we look at it. And they, they they're not thinking about um, knowing the contract and also becoming actively involved when it comes time for bargaining. 
right? Where we, you know, when bargaining comes around, this is what, what do you want to do? And there's not a lot of people saying we're, we're going to make this collected decision to push hard for this. That's where solidarity is really, really important. I'm hoping that if when we're talking about cultural change at the campus, one of the, the cultural changes can be that the union members see that they are as responsible for the union. Um, and they are, they are, uh, they need to know the contract. Uh, Mary Rapine had this great idea. I thought it was great, um, which is just like on uh, Constitution Day, we read the Constitution. We should have like contract day. Just put a microphone inside a G building. We'll put it on all four campuses and just have people get up and read it, and then and then say, "Wow, you know what's not in here? Oh my God! You know what? It wasn't just Greg Sotheris was right. We don't have anything in here about shared governance that, that's required, or we don't have about about uh, control. Of what does it mean to have um, fa uh, freedom, academic freedom? What what are the limits of that? A lot of people really don't know. And, and it, it's when they, they feel that that right has been uh, taken away. That's when they get, oh, they're mad and they, they, they seek out um, redress from the union. And sometimes the union has to say, we can't do anything. So I'd like to see that, that um, in order to address these larger issues of economic capitalism, we have to take responsibility for our own union. I'm not, blank, you know, I don't want to make it all sound like, well, we get the union we deserve, but we get the union <laughs> we deserve if we are not guardians plug for the union. Elections will be coming up in the spring for the union. We will be looking for <laughs> executive committee members. <laughs>